Hello, and welcome back to the video lecture series for Introduction to the Art of Programming Using Scala. In this uh, chapter, in the book itself, we, rep we introduce the software life, life cycle and run you through the, the different steps, the analysis, design, implementation, debugging, uh, and maintenance. Um, in the videos, there's not really much of a reason for me to repeat uh, kind of the, the lecture material. I like to, in the videos, primarily demonstrate how things uh, work and, and give you the stuff that the static book can't. So in this case, we're working on a project. Now on the book itself, the, the project that's worked on is a drawing program, and it takes you through the steps in, in writing that drawing program. Uh, in the videos, I'm actually going to choose a separate project. Uh, part of this is for the uh, diversity, just so that you can see something different. Another part is due to the simple reason that uh, even if I were to pick the same project, I wouldn't come up with the same result in the sense that things would, would wind up being different. Even if I solve exactly the same problem, I will write different code to, to do it each time. And as programs get bigger, they would deviate more and more. So instead of trying to exactly recreate the drawing program as it is developed in the book, uh, I'm working on a different project here. And the project that I want to, to do in the videos is something of a, um, I don't know how to refer to it, an electronic classroom type of, of project. It is going to be networked, and the idea is that it can be logged into by students or by uh, faculty, and you can have multiple courses added into it. It should be a program that students can use, for example, to take quizzes uh, or tests, uh, also to do exercises uh, for, for a class. In fact, it would be a class much like um, the one that might use this book. Uh, and because it's something that might use this book, you want to have the ability for, for exercises to include writing code and executing the code, uh, etc. Now this is going to be a networked application, so there is going to be both a client side and a, a server side to it. And what I want to do is kind of run you through at least a little bit of the process of doing the analysis, and in this video the analysis, and in the next video the design, for a project like this. And then we'll get to, to the point where we'll write a little bit of code. So one of those significant steps in doing an analysis. So analysis is actually defining the problem. And I've kind of loosely described the types of, of things that you could do. If you were really doing uh, a formal analysis, you would want to go into detail. What are all the different features, of the, the different things that a user can do when running this system? And we'd also do things like if there were GUIs for it, draw them out show what it's going to look like. So we're kind of talking about what it's going to look like and what it's going to do. That's the analysis phase. And you'll note that at this point, there is no coding. We're not even thinking about coding. That's one of the significant aspects of analysis. One of the tools that's often used for analysis is use case diagrams. So these are UML use case diagrams. UML stands for Unified Modeling Language. And it's a graphical tool for doing things. Now, one of the things about UML is that it is uh, the term it's often used is it is whiteboard friendly. You can draw out UML diagrams quite nicely. I'm not going to do that for these purposes. I am going to draw them on the computer uh, and I'm going to use a tool called Creately uh, to draw this. Um, and the, so this is the Creately tool and I have created a use case diagram. I do not necessarily expect that you will do your things under Creately. You will probably do most of your UML on paper or on whiteboards. Um, but the advantage of UML is that it gives you a way of expressing ideas that is more visual and involves a lot fewer words than what you would have had if you were to just uh, write straight up prose for it. So in the case of a use case diagram, there are just a few elements. Use case diagrams in many ways are, are very simple. We have systems, sorry, and 
So I can create a system here by dragging it over. In this case, I am going to go with the client. Okay, so in some ways there's actually two pieces of, of software that we're going to write here. I'm going to, to work first with the client. And so this box represents everything that the client itself can do. There are other types of things that we can have inside of here. For, and so the, the next element is an actor. Now the actors, as are, they're represented by little stick figures, a lot of times these are indeed people. Uh, so one of the actors in our system then would be a student. Okay. Student ha should have the ability to log in to uh, to the system and and do whatever the the features were. It is also possible the system the same client is going to be used by the instructor. Actually, we could write a separate client for the instructor. Uh, for now, I'm going to go with the assumption that we'll put both the instructor and the student inside of the the same client and have them interact with the same piece of software. Now the actors aren't always people. Okay? The actor can be anything that is external to the system that causes the system to do things. And in this particular case, uh, in addition to the student or the instructor, the person who's logged in, telling the client to do something, it is also possible that the other program that is involved, the server, can also ask for the client to do things. Uh, so I'll just throw that in there. Now I mentioned, so beyond these, and you can see over here there's another type of actor if you don't like the simple stick figure. Uh, the, fourth el or the third element that we're going to be adding, and so we're only going to add actors, the system, and a use case. In fact, we'll add lots of use cases. That's the primary thing that gets put in here, as is given away by the fact that these are called a use case diagram. I've already mentioned one use case. When you first run this program, one of the things that you have to do is log in. Okay, if, if this program is going to be used uh, to, to store s significant information, uh, you have to be able to log into it. Now, who can log in? Well, the server can't really log in. Uh, but the student and the instructor would need the ability to log in. And we indicate that by drawing a connection between the two. And I'll stick with the generalization here. So this says that the student can log in. And I also want to have it so that the instructor can log in uh, to the system. Uh, what are other things that, that you should be able to do? Well, the student is going to need to have the ability to uh, select a course. Okay. Um, and once again, Going to connect the, the student there. Uh, I might also want the student to be able to um, to take a quiz. Okay. That would be a another use case for for things that I've mentioned in here. And we would want to continue doing this process and come up with every possible thing that we foresee whatever the user is doing. Now taking a quiz is probably only for students. Turns out that selecting a course is the type of thing that we might also want to have it so that our instructors can do. Uh, so both students and instructors can log in and, and select courses. Only students take quizzes. Uh, probably in the case of a, an instructor, the equivalent would be make a quiz. Okay. And so that is a use case that is available to the instructor, but not to the student. Uh, you can also imagine if there is a login, that there will be a logout. And so we would build up a significant set of 
different actions that the actors in the system can do. How do they interact with the system? What can they tell the system uh, to, to do? Um, now, in some cases, uh, so, so this right here is a, is a fair